Thank you for that kind introduction, Joe. I apologize, uh, folks, as I accidentally was sharing the wrong desktop. So I need to get that going and then I can get the slides set up properly so you guys can see what I need you to see. Does that look good, Joe? Do I have the right screen shared? It looks like I do. Looks good to me. All right. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you to Joe for putting Crisis Con together. I think it's a really, really great thing to be able to kind of bridge the gap that we're all feeling from what's happening with COVID-19 and getting to spend some time reconnecting and still getting to share knowledge. Um, so what I'm here to talk about today is uh, close access operations and what role they can play when it comes to threat intel, which is uh, my background. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, hi, uh, I am Wiley Newmark, AKA Orcos on Twitter. Um, I work at CrowdStrike as a senior intelligence analyst doing mission leadership for the Middle East and Iran and also doing some more niche stuff related to Russia. So with that, I'll get started. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start by defining close access operations, what they are and what they are not. Um, there's a lot of kind of very specific nomenclature that comes around with this type of ac activity. And my goal is to help make that clearer and more understandable for everyone. Uh, then I want to do a little case study, kind of what these things look like in practice um, and how their existence and practice can translate into stuff that we have to deal with on the threat intel side, and in this case, a specific instance of attribution musical chairs. And then uh, I want to try to sum up, you know, what exactly I'm hoping is actionable for you as consumers following this talk. So I'm just going to give you a very straightforward <laughs> definition. Um, close access operations are on-site hacking activities conducted by trained intelligence personnel with sophisticated equipment while deployed to areas physically proximate to targets considered not viable for remote compromise. So there's a lot of stuff there that needs to be broken down. Uh, and I'll just go in order, starting with on-site hacking activities. That means that the activity is conducted physically proximate, as it says later in the definition, to your actual target. Uh, it's not somebody back in a keyboard in a skiff or somewhere or in their living room trying to get into a target. They, these, the people conducting close access are on the ground by the target. Uh, those people are trained intelligence personnel. Uh, they're intelligence officers uh, using specialized equipment uh, for the specific purpose of compromising targets via physical proximity uh, in means that are not viable otherwise remotely. Um, I think that that kind of sums up the, the basics of it, but it, the, the core concepts really are you're on site, you're an intelligence officer, you're using equipment and you are doing this because you couldn't compromise the target within the bounds of your mission parameters or efficacy remotely. So what does the impact of that mean on analysis? So first of all, it can change how you think of an adversary's conceptions of recon, initial access, and delivery. Uh, it can skew that. Uh, close access operations suggest that the adversary engaged in extensive reconnaissance prior to the operation, or at least enough to determine that initial access could not be achieved remotely. Also, CAO may be the result of a recon effort against a downstream target where the decision was then made that a close access operation against an upstream entity would be the best means to get downstream access to the final end stage target. Um, it can also change uh, delivery techniques and procedures. So you may see uh, people jumping stages in their activity, you know, they might skip a dropper and if they can achieve close access, they're going right to more of a backdoor implant or something like that. So you may see an acceleration through an adversary's typical behavior in an intrusion. Um, and this can really expand outward into targeting, actor intent, capabilities, and scope of activity when you're thinking about the actor involved. Um, close access operations are a resource and time intensive uh, process. So entities targeted usually are of higher priority for adversaries. That may mean that the actor has pressures factoring in, into its intent, into why the active entity being targeted is being hit with close access. 
Uh, leadership interest is a good example or possibly an immediate intelligence requirement or a crisis intelligence requirement. Also, good close access operations are not something that every uh, intelligence service is capable of um, or even you know, non-state actors are capable of. So if a compromise occurs via close access, then it can be an indicator of the broader capabilities available to or associated with um, a specific actor involved. So close access is typically used against relatively discrete targets. Um, the example that I think is most useful that I'll be talking about later is the attempted operation against the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Um, and that targeting can provide insights to, for analysts into the scope of related activity that you either are observing or may perceive. Um, you know, all of these things that I've described can definitely factor in into attribution-related analysis. Um, there's substantive variables, resources, technical competence, intelligence requirements, time, all of these things can factor into how you look and potentially attribute an actor. Um, and finally, this is something that I've encountered a lot talking about this, is that it's important to distinguish close access operations from human enabled cyber or blended operations um, or, or insider threats. Um, to, to be clear, a close access operation, as I said before, is there are intelligence personnel, officers on the ground conducting activity. Um, they usually have diplomatic immunity um, in the given country, so they have certain protections, there's certain in inhibitors to risk. Um, this is compared to a human enabled cyber operation or a blended operation where an intelligence service or an actor is using a human placed source who may also qualify as an insider threat to conduct activity on, on a network. There's higher risk involved uh, in blended operations because you're putting an asset in jeopardy as opposed to your own personnel. Um, and so close access operations are often a course of action that are deemed not to jeopardize an asset, but there's still a higher risk operation for a conducting service than a traditional remote compromise operation. So when I hear people then say, okay, this is a distinction without a difference, it's, it's all just human enabled, um, I, I do very much get triggered. Uh, a pragmatic counter perspective to what I'm saying is that in the end, the end impact of the action is compromise via a human enabled means, the final impact is the same, then the nuance of the means doesn't really matter as much. I, I disagree, uh, I can see the value in that perspective, but I sincerely believe that there is a distinction with a difference here that can impact our work and subsequently the work of our customers and defenders more generally. The final impact of a blended operation, which is using an asset, who may be in place and have insider access or a close access operation may be the same in a fundamental sense, but the means employed is a value piece of, piece of data in understanding the difference between different types of adversaries, especially from a counterintelligence analysis perspective. And assumptions can really be things that come and cut, cut, cut you off at the knees, especially about how an impact came to be, such as a compromise. So in my mind, the more realistic conception of how an impact came to pass, the better. That more realistic conception can change the calculus in a given customer's threat model, including their defender's prevention strategy. So it's the difference between being concerned if you have an insider threat, somebody who's been uh, compromised one way or another and is granting, is abusing their insider access to hand off to an outside party, compared to the threat mitigation preventions that you would take if you're actually getting compromised via close access because your Wi-Fi signal extends three blocks down the street and is unsecured or improperly secured. So with those fundamental concepts out of the way, I'd like to focus on uh, my case study, which is GRU operations, specifically the ones that were burned back in October 2018 in a U.S. Department of Justice indictment and a really brutal PowerPoint put together by the uh, Dutch Ministry of Defense. So this indictment covered a whole bunch of stuff. I am, will admit up front right now, I am not as technically competent as to walk you through all the different elements in these graphics, but I wanted you to be able to see a basic setup provided by multiple governments as to how these te this technology works. But Generally, the activities covered relate to primarily to Russian nexus targeting of international sporting entities between July 2016 
and August 2017, and some associated other activity targeting entities in the U.S., and then finally targeting chemical weapons uh, entities in April of 2018. So there were really three rounds of activity covered in this massive indictment that I just want to sum up to kind of give it solid examples of what close access operations look like and who they targeted. So uh, first round was uh, July to September of 2016 related to the 2016 Olympics where close access teams uh, were deployed to target uh, World Anti-Doping Association and International Olympic Committee personnel in Rio de Janeiro. Um, what do these operations look like then? Uh, in July, they conducted reconnaissance, following people, identifying where they were staying, identifying the equipment where they were staying. In August, uh, the GRU officers uh, compromised Wi-Fi ho hotel Wi-Fi routers to uh, own network traffic, and subsequently, um, oh God, sorry about that, folks, um, and subsequently capture individual targets, activity, and credentials. Uh, and then in September, this continued, uh, you, and they used spoofed Wi-Fi networks and or compromised hotel Wi-Fi networks from the same chain of hotels to capture traffic and credentials from other individuals. Uh, then in, uh, the second round was against the Canadian Center for Ethics and Sport uh, in Lusanne in Switzerland, uh, targeting personnel from CCES there in September 2016 with the end goal of compromising CCES networks in Canada and hopefully then also compromise associated networks through things like WADA and so on. Uh, so in this situation, the uh, actors connected to and compromised the individuals, the target individuals hotel Wi-Fi, pivoted into the target's laptop and deployed a known fancy bear malware, uh, X agent and X tunnel, and then compromised their email account to send internal fishes to other members of that person, of that individual's organization. Um, Taken together, um, these two rounds targeting you know, WADA, IOC, and CCES, the material extracted by the operators um, who were then able, who, who were operators back in Moscow, who were then able to control activity on the compromised systems was later exposed by the Fancy Bears hack team influence operations between 2016 and 2017. Finally, in the third round of activity, which is related to the graphics you're seeing here, um, was April 2018, uh, the same team that targeted these other um, sporting entities was sent to The Hague in order to try and compromise uh, the OPCW uh, and then had plans to go and then target the Spies Swiss Chemical Laboratory uh, in Switzerland. This was related to gathering data associated with the ongoing investigation of the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter in England. Here, the gear was, uh, as pictured, was oriented to conduct long distance surreptitious interception of Wi Fi signals and traffic, as well as harvesting Wi Fi user credentials via equipment placed in a rental car parked adjacent to OPCW with the trunk filled with gear and then aimed at the target building. And it's notable that data seized in this gear that's pictured uh, revealed links back to the activity in Rio in 2016. Lusain in 2016 and to other activity in Kuala Lumpur in December 2017 that wasn't fully expanded upon inside the indictments. So this is an example here of, you know, this is what close access operations really look like. It's really an, an access vector. They have their own sense of the kill chain in the general sense that we understand it. But this all is then designed for other operators you know, usually the guys back in the skiffs, back in vaults, what have you, to be able to then have implants that they can reach out to and talk to. It's, it's about the access and often Wi-Fi is a major element of how that access is achieved. So how does this translate into a practical problem for threat intelligence? Um, for me, it's translated into understanding reporting about what Kaspersky uh, calls Hades. It's been an incredibly complicated mess of tangled attribution that I'll have a chart for later. But basically, um, the idea here is uh, Kaspersky attributes Olympic Destroyer and a variety of computer network exploitation activities related to it to an actor uh, it tracks as Hades. Uh, this includes the initial access documents sent that eventually provided access to the deployment of Olympic Destroyer against Olympic related entities for the 2018 Olympics, uh, as well as other spear phishing activities that occurred later. Um, 
from the description that's been provided by Kaspersky in public documents, uh, specifically uh, their t June 2018 blog, uh, as well as a cyber war con talk, Hades appears to really be kind of a reminiscent of what they track as Sophocy, which again is more aligned with what uh, I track at CrowdStrike as Fancy Bear, as a possible door kicker, so an initial access team designed to generate access and then hand off to uh, other operators associated with Sophocy or and in my case, Fancy Bear. What does this look like? Uh, Non-binary executable and infection vector, you know, macro docs, uh, downloading obscured PowerShell Empire, uh, PowerShell commands that then connect to, uh, and deploy PowerShell Empire, heavily obfuscated scripts. Uh, and they note uh, that there's similar obfuscated macro structure between the CNE macro documents used in the early stages of the Olympic Destroyer campaign and later documents that targeted a variety of European entities between May and June of 2018, including targeting chemical and biological uh, related entities, including OPCW. And uh, as you can see from one of the screen caps here, the, one of them actually had SPIES themed content as well. But then, following new U.S. indictments, well, new at the time, uh, the October 2018 indictments that is the genesis for this talk, um, they linked this activity to specifically to the close access operations, as you can see in the second screen cap here, where it cites both close access operations as well as multiple pieces of known Fancy Bear, APT28, SOFAC tooling, such as X-Agent and X-Tunnel. So here we come into where we're starting to see adversary overlap, conflation of different people's attribution. Um, to be clear, uh, we, at CrowdStrike, we track things like APT28, Sophocy, that kind of thing. It, to us, that's Fancy Bear. Uh, things like Sandworm, uh, that's Voodoo Bear to us. Um, Hades, I found, is an interesting thing in that it seems to imply an overlap between the two. Uh, the you know, indictments in 2018 specifically link the deployment of Fancy Bear malware to Unit 26165 in the GRU, um, including the information operations that existed as a result. But it also describes specific infrastructure, uh, both related to Fancy Bear hack team uh, and in a prior indictment related to things like DC leaks to Unit 74455. So you have two real units in play here. And available information suggests that Voodoo Bear, uh, including Olympic Destroyer and the macro documents that I just discussed previously, uh, are also perpetrated by the GRU. This is, is supported primarily by public research that's come out through Andy Greenberg's book Sandworm, as well as a February 2020 uh, UK NCSC indictment uh, or announcement uh, attributing a wide variety of activity, uh, notably excluding NotPetya, to uh, and notably, the Olympic Destroyer, I'm sorry, it included not Petya, to Voodoo Bear. Uh, and linked Voodoo Bear, uh, Sandworm, these names, excluding Hades, explicitly to GRU Unit 74455. So what we have here is Unit 26165 closely aligning with Fancy Bear, Unit 74455 broadly aligning to Voodoo Bear. And we've also seen, you know, parallel things here in the press. Close access operations, specifically in the indictments, are attributed to 26165, but we also have press reporting and government sources, you know, linking not patchy and other things to uh, Unit 74455 and Voodoo Bear. So you now have 26165 clearly seems to be this very CNE focused actor can that seems to be large enough to support both remote access operations such as we've seen at the dnc and close access operations as was seen against all of these sporting entities and that were disrupted against chemical weapons entities now kaspersky attributes the spear phishing that uh was then that seemed to apparently be preparation for the disrupted close access operations against chemical weapon entities as being related to these as being related to hades so you Ostensibly then, Hades conducting these macro documents with specifically themed content could have been a related initial access attempt to either support or maybe serve as a replacement for having to conduct close access operations against OPCW uh, and spies, uh, SPIES. But then also in this cyber war con talk, you see an apparent attribution of fancy bear malware deployment following close access operations to Hades as well. The, the exact quote given during the talk was 
provides penetration services to other groups like Sophacy. Sadly, there wasn't a Q&A because it was a lightning round talk, and I'd love to get more into that someday. Um, but so you see this, this link here, which to me puts the, the latter claim at potentially at loggerheads with the apparent division of labor between 26165 and tracked adversaries. You know, is Hades a subgroup of Fancy Bear? Is it a voodoo bear subgroup that supports Fancy Bear, such as maybe for initial access and handoff to Fancy Bear for X agent or X tunnel deployment? Is it a joint Fancy Bear voodoo operation that might indicate some sort of organizational overlap between 26165 and 74455? I don't, there's not enough information, at least from my perspective, to make a final judgment call. But I do think it's you know an indication of one of the interesting kind of attribution problems that we can come up with in the face of this. So I put together this very rough Maltigo chart to just kind of try and lay out exactly where I end up at the end of the day when I keep coming back to this problem set is you have you know 26165 linked through July and October US indictments very clearly to the use of tools like X Agent and X Tunnel, which we do attribute to Fancy Bear. Uh, but then you also have 26165 describing being described as conducting close access operations that were either disrupted or preempted against OPCW uh, and SPIES. And then for each of those two targets, you have one macro document each that's been attributed by Kaspersky to Hades with themed content related to those targets, deployed, or at least appearing in virus total, um, in temporal proximity to the failed close access operations. But you know, you have from uh, public reporting in the Andy Green book, Sandworm book, you have those same two documents attributed to Sandworm by FireEye, which Sandworm, you know, according to UK NCSC is GRU unit 74455. And you have CrowdStrike attributing Olympic Destroyer to Voodoo Bear, Fancy Bear uh, not being connected to that. Hades being responsible for Olympic Destroyer per Kaspersky and Sandworm being responsible for Olympic Destroyer per public statements and uh, media reporting such as the book Sandworm. So you have this very muddy pool of trying to sort out where exactly are these initial access efforts residing? Is it something ad hoc? Is it something formalized? Um, and this is just the kind of problem that I spend a lot of time ruminating on uh, as a background thing in my day-to-day -day -day work. So we have the possible, you know, return of Hades. There was recently a tweet about this uh, in a short blog post where a Chinese firm attributed a recent COVID-19 themed mal, mal document to Hades under the identification of Tricky Mouse. I've put the uh, blog URL right there. These are the screen caps uh, taken from that blog. Um, it appears that this document is a non-binary executable infection vector again obfuscated power cell scripts uh, connects to Empire, I think. I'm sorry, that's a duplicate on my part. But it's just similar structuring, but it's not quite the same that I've been seeing with uh, the original documents. Um, but the attribution has not been independently confirmed or corroborated. Uh, I, I certainly can't confirm or corroborate it, and I haven't seen any other research come out to do so. But it does raise questions. You know, It's doubtful that Hades has been gone all this time, so you know, is this Hades? Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they came back uh, using COVID-19 themes, as we're seeing many actors do. Um, but if they've been gone for so long, where have they been and what have they been doing? So just getting to kind of wrapping it up, and I know I'm a little bit ahead of schedule here. Um, what I'm hoping you take away from this is that close access operations are meaningful edge cases in what we can encounter as threat intelligence analysts. Uh, they can complicate attribution before, during, and after the fact of an investigation. Um, understanding if the activity that you're looking at was enabled via close impact, uh, close access operation can impact your analysis. Um, it, can it can inform how you conceive of an adversary or a responsible actor. Um, but it can also impact the mitigation recommendations you give to customers or defenders based on knowledge of whether or not close access was leveraged inside of a particular set of activity. And finally, um, close access operations do present a meaningful variable in the development of customer threat models. So if you're an international sporting organization, maybe a couple of years ago, you weren't really concerned about close access operations for whatever reason. Now, if 
you're providing you know, advice to such an entity, it would make sense to include knowledge and awareness of the threats for existing from close access operations in order to help them understand what their threats really look like from a state nexus perspective. And with that, uh, I know I'm a little bit early, but presentation just sort of ends. So uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Um, I'll stop my share now and uh, happy to take some questions. Thanks. Well, that was really good. Um, and I almost wish that we gave you like another 20 minutes or whatever to start deep diving into some of that stuff. So I think one thing that I have a question for, we, we've had a lot of commentary so far for, in chat, but not an actual question. I don't know if you have the question and answer panel open to see if there's anything there, but yet again, it's not working for me. But one question I had, so splitting up, you know, typically we've seen Voodoo Bear, Sandworm, Hades, all kind of clumped together. So are you looking at that as really being a distinction between initial access operations and then effects teams? Or I guess, can you speak to that a little bit more uh, detailed? Sure. So um, my personal view, the personal theory that I have, and again, I emphasize that this isn't CrowdStrike's theory, it's mine. <laughs> is it Weasel looks, words. Yeah. Um, we consider them legal disclaimers. Um, my, my thought is that it seems appropriate to, given the wide swath of targeting related to Hades that's been reported publicly and linked by different analysis in the industry, Hades, uh, I, I think of it more as, when I think of Hades, I think of an initial access team that does do handoff to other effects or exploitation teams. Uh, in the case of Olympic Destroyer, it's entirely possible that the same people who are doing initial access were the same people who then did the effects with Olympic Destroyer. But then you have the evidence of, you know, it looks like you have initial access efforts according to the at Kaspersky talk where you have Hades initial access and then apparently you have deployment of fancy bear tools. So maybe there's a handoff there for just traditional exploitation and collection operations uh, as opposed to something more uh, sexy in terms of effects. Um, I, I personally am of the belief that, you know, this might be a specific initial access component, but I also admit that there's not enough visibility from my perspective in order to say that definitively. Very oh, we cool. We actually have a question in the Q&A thing. Ah, okay. Uh, get to that and then there's one in chat as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the question is, typically GRU has been linked to destructive attacks. Would you say they have changed that model for a more stealthy one? Um, I would be reluctant to broadly characterize the word attack in that sense. Um, the GRU has been linked to information operations, destructive operations, uh, which I call computer network attack operations, uh, and espionage intelligence collection, which I think of as computer network exploitation. I don't think that their model has changed to anything stealthier than it used to be. I, I think that they've almost certainly responded to the fact that they're activities are getting so much attention and coverage uh, in press and industry reporting that's public. So obviously they're going to have to change TTPs in order to avoid detection, but I wouldn't say uh, that a difference between stealth and potential destructive intent has anything that can really be differentiated from one another. It, it, I, I think it's the, the wrong way to really approach the different terminologies there. Uh, and I wouldn't want to mischaracterize the idea that if they're being quieter, then they're not being destructive. But if they're being destructive, then they're not going to be quieter. Right? You, you can be destructive and quiet, or you can be collecting intelligence and be loud. Um, so the next question I'm seeing is, what's the financial technical barrier to performing close access operations and related? Is there any notable reporting uh, you can point to of close access operations targeting private sector, whether by state or non-state actors? Um, Technical and financial uh, barriers uh, exist, uh, although I'm sure that if you went deep enough into the internet and talking to people who are more technically knowledgeable than I do, you could put together your own gear like this. I mean, they found a Wi-Fi pineapple uh, in the Netherlands when they busted the GRU team there, so some of the equipment is definitely off the shelf. But I think the biggest barrier is knowledge, um, being able to do these things discreetly and do them well uh, means you have to have very smart people, trained people who are able to engage, hopefully, in some sort of rehearsal process and uh, operational prep. Uh, in terms of notable public reporting, 
I would really say, I mean, these uh, IGOs are technically not government organizations. I mean, they're international organizations, they're international uh, governance organizations, but I don't, I think of them more as the private sector. Um, the DOJ indictment really is the best thing out there on this, uh, especially if you're looking for a focus on what it looks like in context of broader activity. I would really recommend reading the Department of Justice October 2018 indictment and the remarks that accompanied it by the Dutch Ministry of Defense and the Dutch Ministry of Defense PowerPoint. I'd love one day just to give a talk walking through how mind boggling that PowerPoint was. They, that was the most thorough burning I've ever seen of an intelligence operation uh, formally released by a government. It was nuts. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, has there been any evidence of Hades as initial access or handoff to Turla, uh, Iron Hunter, Venomous Bear, or handoff to Berserk Bear, Iron Liberty? Uh, so um, I have not seen any indication of that at all, I've seen no indication of any relationship between Hades or whatever this initial access group's activity is between um, those actors, uh, adversaries, and whatever Hades is doing. Um, I've only seen them interacting or showing up in overlap between GRU Nexus actors. Anything else? I still got a few minutes, I think. You do. So kind of uh, building along from the uh, last question that you answered. So in terms of handoff between entities that may be more linked to FSB or SBR uh, or SVR entities or whatever, in terms of overall potential GRU overlap and, you know, certainly looking at things like Sandworm and some of the indictments as well as the Dutch PowerPoint. Um, do you see that there is an increasing compartmentalization of operations even within the services themselves on a Russian nexus, such that you are increasingly seeing distinct access and operational teams as opposed to one entity, like it seemed for the longest time that Fancy Bear was doing everything, um, but instead having really distinct entities carrying out different phases of operations. Um, the short answer is no, but the long answer is that my answer isn't based on long-term immediate like tracking of that kind of behavior. I, f I focus on more, my, my role uh, in Russia stuff is to look at kind of discrete problem sets like Hades and do kind of deep dives into that. And I wouldn't want to speak uh, on behalf of the people more knowledgeable in my team who could answer that more, more directly. What I would say from a counterintelligence perspective um, is that the Russian services are notorious for feuding with each other, competing with each other, and even within certain services with competing with different parts of themselves. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if you see certain actors jealously guarding um, their targets or their operational dividends from other services. Um, a really great example that's not cyber, but you can uh, kind of apply the same logic, is that during the Cold War, um, uh, the end of the Cold War, and then going into the twenty, the late 20th and early 21st century, the SVR and the GRU were known to target the same type of economic information, uh, including if it was just open source or like gray literature, and then rush to see who could report it back to Moscow first. Um, so you could hypo hypothesize that similar dynamics might exist between cyber actors associated with different services. Uh, and even potentially between cyber actors within services. Although I imagine that the, the thresholds for entities within services not sharing would be exponentially higher than between uh, separate services. I hope that also answers the question about uh, services won't share capabilities. I, I, I think that sharing capabilities is something that would only really happen if it was a major operation that was, you know, issued from very high strategic command. So leadership at the highest levels demanding that everybody play nice with each other in order to achieve a specific effect. Well, very cool. So I know we're running a little bit early, 